In this video, we'll connect an external display to the ESP32 and show a simple image. This small package consists of the OLED display itself, as well as an integrated circuit controller called the SSD1306. The SSD1306 handles the nitty-gritty details of showing whatever data is stored in its internal graphics display data RAM, or GDD RAM, on the display. The job of the ESP32 is to send the image content to the SSD1306. To receive the image content from the ESP32, the SSD1306 IC supports several protocols, including I2C, 6800 or 8080 parallel interfaces, and three or four wire serial interfaces. The manufacturer of your package already made the decision of which protocol to use, so your pins may differ from mine. The manufacturer of my device chose to wire it up to use the I2C protocol. If you have an SPI or SPI enabled device, you should still be able to get it working by following most of the same steps, but simply choose the SPI variant in the device tree. Speaking of the device tree, it might be helpful to understand a bit about how the SSD1306 IC works so that the device tree properties we'll need to configure later make sense. The GDD RAM contains one bit of data for each LED or pixel on the display. If a certain bit has the value 1, the corresponding pixels on the display should, in normal operation, be turned on. A zero-bit value turns the pixel off. This simple one-bit-per-pixel scheme is possible because there are no colors on this display. Each pixel is simply on or off. The display has 128 LEDs in the horizontal direction, which are called segments, and 64 LEDs in the vertical direction, which are called commons. We can calculate the size of the GDD RAM by multiplying 128 by 64 to see that 8192 bits will be required to control the 8192 LEDs. Now, a bit is not a common quantity to transport over a protocol, however. The I2C protocol sends a byte, or 8 bits at the time, and the receiver sends an acknowledgement message after receiving each byte. Conveniently, the GDD RAM is split into 8 pages, where each page refers to 128 pixels horizontally and 8 pixels vertically. Effectively, we'll write to the GDD RAM a byte at a time, which means that the on or off state of 8 pixels will be contained in each byte. The SSD1306 display controller keeps refreshing the contents it has in its GDD RAM to the display until the ESP32 sends a command to, for example, blank the screen or update the GDD RAM with new pixel information. It's important to note that the display will continue showing a picture without any further action required from the ESP32 after the initial transfer on the content. Let's imagine, for the time being, that all of the pixels are turned off. If we look a bit closer, each pixel is an LED, with an anode and cathode. Every anode is connected through a switch to a segment. 
In essence, the segment drivers provide 128 current sources. The cathode of each LED is connected through a switch to a common. Commons will sync current if both the segment and common switches are closed, making the OLED light up, as shown in this example of a single LED lighting up. Conversely, if either or both of the switches are open, no current flows and the LED stays unlit. It's important to note that there is no direct connection between the segment wires and common wires. All connections go through the LEDs, as highlighted by the dots at the connection points in this illustration. As we already learned, there are 128 segments and 64 commons, but 8192 LEDs. If we wanted to individually address each and every LED, we would require 8192 current sources. This is rather impractical, and as it turns out, unnecessary. As long as an LED is turned on frequently enough, our eyes and brain will perceive it as a constant light. This may be how the monitor you're watching this video on operates as well. By turning LEDs on and off, over and over again, typically at frequencies of around 30 Hz or higher. In practice, the SSD1306 uses a procedure called multiplexing to cover all the LEDs in the display. Each common switch is closed and opened in sequence at a constant rate. Any LEDs connected to that common where the segment switch is also closed will light up. Here we see this happening at a very slow down rate. The wires that are lit indicate current flow. Let's zoom out to see the entire display and also speed the animation up a bit. All the lit wires are a bit distracting, so let's turn those off as well. As the frequency of the switches closing and opening increases, you start to see an image appear. Although this animation is a simplification, the general principle is the same as how the SSD1306 IC displays images on the hardware display. This is the circuit diagram. As you can see, it's very simple. We connect the data line STA to GPIO pin 21, which is physical pin 33 on the ESP32W rover, and the clock line SEL to GPIO pin 22, which is physical pin 36. These are the default I squared C0 device pins for this board in Zephyr. To the display, we connect STA, SCL, ground, and 3.3 volts. That's it. If you're looking for the pull-up resistors that I squared C requires, then don't worry. The ESP32 has built-in pull-up resistors, and Zephyr will automatically take care of setting those up for us. Very nice. Now that we have the hardware side of things all set up, it's time for the firmware. If you've been following the other videos in this series, the next steps should hopefully be second nature to you now. The SSD1306 IC is manufactured by Solomon Systec Limited. So we look for any compatibles under their vendor ID, Solomon. And in this case, there's already a compatible provided by the Zephyr project called Solomon, SSD1306 FB. I suspect that the FB probably stands for frame buffer. We choose the I squared C version since that's how our display is configured. Ah, I 
it seems like there are quite a few required properties. Let's have a look at the YAML files too, starting with the Solomon, SSD1306FB-12C.yaml. Interesting. It's empty and simply includes two other files. Let's have a look at those files next. The Solomon SSD 1306FB common YAML file has all the device specific properties. The i2c device.yaml file only specifies one property, reg or reg, and explains that reg should be set to the device address on the i2c bus. Also, note the on bus colon i2c. This is how Zephyr knows that this device is an I2C target device. After inspecting the bindings, it's time to populate the device tree overlay file. Since our display is an I2C device target, we make the node a child of the ESP32 I2C controller, in this case I2C0. Let's call the node SSD1306 and give it a node label with the same name. The compatible is Solomon SSD1306FB. The reg property, as we just found out, refers to the device address on the bus. We typically find this in the display documentation or on the PCB silk screen. In our case, the display seems to have two I2C addresses, hex78 and hex7a. At closer inspection, we see that the solder pads for hex78 appear to have been joined with the resistor. So that is my guess for the appropriate address. Presumably, if you already have another display on the same I2C bus with the same address, you can resolder that resistor onto the other pads to change the I2C address to hex 7A. Let's go back to our device tree overlay file and enter hex 78 as the address for the display on the I2C bus. We add it both to the reg property as well as to the node name with an at symbol as the separator. Some of the following properties only make sense if we understand how the SSD1306 controller and OLED display operates. This is a fascinating topic by itself, but since our focus in this video is on Zephyr, I'll only explain the minimum that I think is required for the properties to make a little more sense. The height property is the number of pixels in the vertical direction. Our display has 64 rows, so we enter that value. Similarly, the width property is the number of pixels in the horizontal direction, which is a 128. By default, the SSD1306 uses something called page addressing mode. As shown in the datasheet, this mode automatically increases the column address pointer after reads or writes. Our ESP32 has to send I2C commands to start the next page. Luckily for us, this is all handled by the Zephyr provider driver, so we don't have to worry about it at all. We can change the segment offset property if we'd like to alter the default starting address for the column start address register, but we'll keep the default however, so zero is the appropriate value to use here. Additionally, we can tell the SSD1306 to start the GDD RAM from any of the eight pages. We do not need to do so, and we'll set the page offset property to zero as well. The display offset property allows us to shift the display upwards by a number of pixels. Values between 0 to 63 make sense on a 64 pixel height display. The image buffer wraps around to the bottom. 
For us, we have no need to shift the display, so a value of 0 is appropriate. As we saw in the earlier animation, the OLED display the SSD1306 controller is driving has a common cathode configuration. That means that the controller will scan repeatedly through each row, one at a time, and act as a current sink for that row. As we learned, this is called multiplexing. And the multiplex ratio property can be set between 16 and 63. That's because there are 64 rows starting from row 0. We would like to multiplex all the rows on the display, so it makes sense to keep this at the default, which is 63. Also, as shown in the early animation, there are 128 segment drivers, one for each column. These act as current sources. There are actually three phases associated with the segment drivers. The first phase discharges the pixels that were charged in the previous frame. The second phase drives the voltage up to the required level. And finally, the third phase is where the current source drives the pixels. To control the duration of phases 1 and 2, we can set the pre-charge P property. This property consists of a byte divided into two nibbles. The first nibble, or four bits if you prefer, is the duration in the number of clock cycles for phase one. The second nibble is the duration of phase two. By default, both phases last for two clock cycles. So we use hex 22. For our display, it makes sense for the common outputs to be scanned in the reverse direction, from last to first. Therefore, we include the com-invdir boolean property to invert the scan direction. If we remove this property, it's equivalent to making it false, and our display will be upside down. Similarly, we'd like to reverse the segments as well. So we include the boolean property segment remap. If we do not include it, that is the equivalent of boolean false, and the image will be inverted horizontally. Depending on which way you'd like your display to be oriented, you can change these properties to what makes sense for you. That should be it for the device tree overlay file. Next, let's check if there are any kconfig options we'll need to enable. A quick kconfig search on the Zephyr website shows us that the main config option is called config ssd1306, and it depends on config display. We also enable the config i2c option since this device is using the i2c protocol. Finally, we also enable the config ssd1306 default and set the config SSD1306 default contrast to 128, the maximum brightness for this display. Great, we should be almost done with the preliminaries. Next, let's program the firmware that will make the magic happen and show actual things on the display. Let's open the main.c file and declare the struct device, like we have in all the previous videos. As usual, we'll use the node label to refer to the device, which is ssd1306 in our overlay file, and we'll call the struct device display. We have to include device.h for this, and let's add kernel.h whilst we're at it. Then we check whether display is null, and whether the device is ready. So far, so good. Pretty much like our previous firmware code. However, this time we're going to use a macro called log error instead of using the printk function for any error messages. To do this, we'll need to include log.h and register the module by calling the log module register macro where we will pass display as the module name. 
This name needs to be unique. Before trying this out, we need to enable the config log kconfig option in our prg.conf. Otherwise, no logs will be output. That should be sufficient to at least ensure that the SP32 can detect the display. Let's build, flash, and then monitor to see if any error messages show up. Hmm, seems like we have a few errors here. Let's dig a bit deeper. You can see that the logging framework in Zephyr shows a timestamp. Then it shows the level of the log, in this case an error. Then it helpfully displays the name of the module that logged the message. The first two are from the I2C and SSD 1306 drivers that are included by Zephyr. The third error is the one we included in the main.c file. Basically, our device is not ready. Time for some troubleshooting. There are several ways we can troubleshoot this. However, I want to try to cover the most obvious things first before spending too much time on detailed debugging. We know from the error log that I2C itself is complaining, so if I2C is not working properly, then we can't expect the device driver to work either. Therefore, I'd like to check if there are any I2C messages being sent by the ESP32 at all. I could use my oscilloscope to do this, but since I have a basic logic analyzer, I'll just plug that into the SDA and SCL pins to monitor the traffic and overlay an I2C decoder to quickly see what messages are being sent. Let's reset the ESP32, and here we have the trace. The ESP32 seems to be correctly sending the start condition and the address right. However, there's no reply on the data bus from the target display. That could mean that the display is not working, or we are not using the correct I2C address. Let's check the datasheet for SSD 1306. Interesting. The datasheet says that slave address is either 011-1100 or 011-1101. What is binary 011-1100 in hexadecimal? Let me use my trusty old calculator. Mm. 3C hex. That's different from the 78 hex written on the PCB. Never mind, it's easy enough to try out. Let's open our device tree file and change the reg property to hex 3C instead of hex 78. Let's do a pristine build and flash and see what comes up on the monitor. Very nice, there are no more error messages. Let's reset the ESP32 and capture another session. Yes, that looks much better. We can see that something, presumably our display, is acknowledging the ESP32's address write on address hex 3C. Now that the ESP32 is talking to the display, we can start sending instructions for what to display on the OLED screen. One way to do this would be to use the SSD 1306 I2C interface directly and send SSD 1306 commands. However, this means that our code would only work for that specific display. Also, we'd have to operate at the I2C level, sending and receiving raw messages. That can become tiresome rather quickly. Instead, will use the Zephyr display drivers that provide a layer of abstraction and would enable us to change our display or protocol in the future with fewer changes to the actual application firmware. There are primarily two drivers that are applicable for our board, the display interface and the monochrome character frame buffer. The monochrome character frame buffer makes it easy to write text to the display. Let's use that driver first. Later, we'll display a simple image using the display interface driver. 
We can see in the online documentation that the character frame buffer driver provides quite a few functions that we can use to display text. If you carefully compare these functions with the SSD1306 datasheet, you'll notice that some functionality is supported by the display, but missing in the driver. For example, the SSD1306 supports hardware scrolling commands, but there are no equivalent functions in the driver. This is one of the trade-offs of using abstraction layers. Some native functionality may not be available. However, if we want to, we can always send those commands using the I2C bus directly and write our own wrapper functions. First, let's include the header file cfb.h. Presumably, this stands for character frame buffer. I'll also save you the pain from seeing build errors later and include the required kconfig option, config character frame buffer, in prj.conf. Before we can print text to the display, we have to initialize the frame buffer driver. We do that by calling the cfb frame buffer init function, with our display device as the only argument. Next, we print a string using the cfb print function. The arguments are the device, the string, and the x and y coordinates to start the text from. We'll start from top left. Finally, we have to call the CFB frame buffer finalize function to actually send the data to the display. Let's build and flash the code. And here we see that the text is displayed with black text on white background. The library even takes care of carriage return when your text is too long for one line. I encourage you to play around with the other functions like CFB frame buffer invert and CFB frame buffer clear to see the effects they have. In the interest of time, however, let's try to use the other display driver to show an image on the display instead of simply text. Let's remove the code we just entered to show the character frame buffer. To keep things simple, I've already created an image with dimensions of 128 by 64 pixels. I also formatted the image as a byte array, which fits the format the SSD1306 expects. This way, we can simply define the array in a C header file and include that header file in main.c. There's a link in the description explaining where you can download the header file, called logo underscore image dot h. Move the logo image dot h file into the source directory together with main dot c. Next, we include it. Let's also include std int since we use uint8 as the type. Finally, include display.h, which is the header file for this driver. If you're interested, I used a web page to convert a bitmap image into this byte representation. I've added a link to the converter I used in the video description. On the Zephyr website, we can see the functions that are provided by this driver. It looks like display write is the main function that will write data to the display. It takes the device, x and y coordinates, as well as pointers to the buffer array itself, and a struct called display buffer descriptor that will describe the layout of the buffer. Let's have a look at the display buffer descriptor struct. Its members are the size of the buffer, the width and height, and something called pitch. Pitch is described as the number of pixels between consecutive rows in the data buffer. For our display, we have 128 pixels for each row, so we'll enter that value. Let's create a const struct and name it buffdesk. 
we know that the height is 64 and width is 128. Since each LED or pixel takes one byte, the buff size should simply be height times width. But hang on a minute. Hard coding these numbers doesn't exactly help to decouple our device configuration from our code. We have at least two options to address this. First, we can use the display drivers display get capabilities function, which includes the X and Y coordinates. The second way would be to use a macro to get this information directly from the device tree. For the sake of exploring the current driver, we'll do it the first way in this example. We start by declaring a variable called capabilities of type struct display capabilities. Next, we call display get capabilities to populate that struct. Let's have a look at the display capability struct in our editor. It seems like it provides X and Y resolution, supported pixel formats, screen info, current pixel format, and current orientation. What is the display pixel format enum? It seems to be a list of different types of pixel formats that displays can use. Some of them are obviously color displays. I'm guessing that the SSD1306 is either mono one or mono one o. We can see in the comments that the difference is whether a zero represents on or off. The display screen info enum seems to describe what kind of system is being used to display information on the screen. I suspect that the SSD1306 should be mono v-tiled, since we already know that it uses 8 pixels ordered vertically. Let's log the capability struct so that we can see the output in the monitor. Interesting. The X and Y resolution makes sense, no surprises there. The supported pixel formats are 4. That is 100 in binary, so bit 2 is set. That is pixel format mono 10, where 1 equals black and 0 equals white. Screen info is 1. That means that bit 0 is 1, which specifies that our 8 pixels are ordered vertically, just as expected. Finally, the current pixel format is simply the only supported format, and the current orientation is 0, which is display orientation normal. Now that we have this data, why don't we use it to replace our magic numbers? First, let's define xres to take the x resolution from the capabilities struct, and do similarly for the y resolution. Then we assign the width and height members with xres and yres. The buffer size is simply the x resolution multiplied by the y resolution. For pitch, however, I'm not quite sure if there's a good way to refer to this across all different types of display devices. If you have suggestions or ideas, please do let me and other viewers know in the comments. For now, we'll define a macro for it. Now we can try to write the image to the display using the display write function. It takes the device, start x and y coordinates, the buffer descriptor and a pointer to the buffer itself. Build and flash, and success! We see the image on the screen. The SSD1306 display doesn't have a backlight, but we can adjust the amount of current that flows through the OLED pixels. The function to adjust this is called display set contrast and takes a value between 0 and 255, where 255 is the highest contrast. As you'll see, this has an effect similar to adjusting brightness. 
Let's create a simple loop that gradually adjusts the contrast up and down. First, let's set the contrast to zero and check for any errors. Next, let's use a 5 millisecond sleep time between each adjustment. In a while loop that will run forever, we first increase the contrast from 0 to 255 in single steps. Then we do the reverse afterwards. Let's build Flash and see what that looks like. Very nice! A simple contrast effect for our image.